Um, we talked a little bit in the first session this morning, the plenary, about the Realizing Just Cities framework that provides us with um, a kind of umbrella, if you like, for the specific projects. And the project and the activities that we're going to be discussing this morning form a key part. And in addition to the um, full local platforms where we have been working that you will be hearing lots about, we also have two project-specific partnerships in Buenos Aires and Shimla in India to ensure that we have seven cities um, on all the major continental regions other than North America as a basis for really wide and diverse engagement with this global agenda. And the objective is really to try to understand how, when a global agenda like uh, Agenda 2030, of which the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are, if you like, the monitoring and evaluation um, component, and then also the new urban agenda and several other components of, of this broad global initiative on sustainable development, how do they actually land through national governments in all the different member countries of the UN and then down to uh, the tens of thousands of areas that are classified as urban in their respective national and local context. And it is really interesting and fascinating and instructive to understand how this works and how the different cities understand and engage with or not to different extents these agendas and how a global agenda articulated very actively by some national governments and very passively by others are then interpreted and taken up or, or remodeled to fit coherently with comparable initiatives that are already being taken to promote urban sustainability in those different contexts. And as you'll see in the next few slides, um, and I'm going to start broadly and then focus down on, on the project, we're working through all these different topics that were mentioned earlier, solid waste management, transport mobility, um, food, cultural heritage, sustainable welfare, poverty reduction, and several others. So the, it provides the flexibility to pick up the areas, the topics, the themes that the individual cities prioritize. And in that sense, it's consistent with that transdisciplinary co-productive way of working that we talked about in general terms uh, during the plenary session this morning. So even though the global agenda is set and therefore we're studying how the local and the national interact with that, we have not been, if you like, prescriptive from um, the Secretariat in how this is going to work. It's very much feeding in, engaging with, in a sort of dialogue with the local partners to try to understand and sometimes also to feed in, to enrich the local process. And one of the things that we hope will come out of the discussion later on is the issue of how the different cities in the study have started to interact with one another. So we've had a kind of learning group, peer-to-peer -peer work we'll talk about, uh, mutual support and learning, and how everybody is gaining and benefiting from understanding how six very different cities are engaging, interacting, interpreting the same global agenda through their different national and local lenses, if you like. That is a key part of it. <coughs> um, we mentioned in passing in, in the film the idea that our definition of sustainability is just cities which are accessible, green, and fair. And we interpret these in very broad terms. So accessibility is not only about physical accessibility, it's about social accessibility, networks, um, access to uh, all sorts of opportunities, as well as services and goods which are available in the city. And again, that feeds into this project in its transdisciplinary way. And this project, in many ways, has helped to cement and deepen the collaborations and the comparisons 
that we've been undertaking in all the other more specific projects uh, which are being discussed in some of the parallel workshops now and again um, after lunch. And this idea that I referred to of working from the, in this case, the global to the local and back again um, is very real and meaningful because one of the objectives of the project and the pilot project in 2015 that preceded this is actually feeding back to the United Nations some of the lessons, some of the interpretations from these seven cities. And they are using that feedback to refine, to modify the wordings of some of the targets and the indicators of the relevant sustainable development goals. And this is part of an ongoing process, um, which is learning from experience, or as the World Bank used to call it, learning by doing. So in that sense, it really is then feeding back up and leading to improvements, which hopefully will help to make these global agendas more uh, appropriate, more intelligible, and, and more operational in the tens of thousands of urban areas around the world. So in addition to Agenda 2030 and the new urban agenda, there are at least two others that were adopted internationally in 2015 and 16, and I tend to think of those four as representing the current global agenda for sustainable development. And the two we haven't mentioned yet are the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, which is really important and inter interacts with the next one, which is the Paris Accord of um, December 2015, um, the, the Climate um, Accord of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which has voluntary national contributions and targets. And as we'll hear in the discussion, at the UN Climate Summit um, at the end of last month, and uh, Sylvia, one of our researchers from Cape Town, participated in um, some of those sessions, there is now an initiative to create a network of cities that will be submitting voluntary local contributions to climate change uh, emissions reductions and, 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 and related sets of targets. So what we're trying to do here is position cities as key actors, not only in their local and national context, but also to show how fundamentally important in an urban dominated world, which we now inhabit, all of this is if we're going to meaningfully contribute to sustainable societies in the future. So for those who are not familiar, the new urban agenda, which we will talk about no doubt as part of the discussion, but it'll, it'll be a relatively minor part, was adopted um, at Habitat 3 in Quito um, almost exactly uh, three years ago, and is a long-term 20-year initiative by the UN, and the first time that they have adopted a specific international agenda focused on urban areas, and that reflects the importance of everything that I've already said. And it links to all the other elements of rights-based um, urban living, sustainable consumption, integrated urban planning, disaster resilience and management, climate change, um, sustainable financing frameworks, which is a topic that we hear much too little about. Because ultimately, having adequate resources to do all these things is the essential glue that makes it all possible or constrains and prevents and forces difficult choices when local authorities have to prioritize um, what they're going to do. And again, we'll hear some specific examples of that uh, in a few minutes. And then um, we've done a mapping of our different projects in Mr. Urban Futures as part of the broader context to this work. And what it shows, again, we're not going to go into details, but that we have projects that in part or whole address every single one of the 17 sustainable development goals. And you won't be surprised to know that the one where you have the tall blue bar on the histogram is goal 11 on sustainable um, cities and, and communities, because as an urban research center, of course, pretty well all our activities relate in part to goal 11. And within goal 11, um, you'll see that there's quite a good distribution across the, the different um, 
targets and, and their respective indicators. And the precise balance differs from city to city, and it also differs uh, across the comparative projects. But apart from the realizing just cities and the participatory cities, which are sort of learning processes, and we haven't included those in, in this diagram, the other nine comparative projects um, address at least one, and um, in the case of the project we're discussing uh, uh, today, the vast majority of the sustainable development goals. And let me now hand over to Sandra to talk us through Um, David, I think, already mentioned that the project uh, basically is about, we have seven cities and we have partnerships where it's a researcher together with city officials. Uh, and what we've been doing is two aspects. One, what you could argue is the political process. How are cities localizing, adapting, you know, by localizing, I mean adapting to the city level this globally agreed agenda that it was also agreed by national governments, which means not everything is designed for a city, but everywhere is acknowledged the important role of cities. So how are cities interpreting, adapting, and working with these agendas? Or are they working with them at all? Which is also one of the findings. Some cities are really have com political commitment and engagement with them. Other ones a little bit less, and maybe the panelists will talk about that. And we've also looked at how is it monitoring progress to achieve the SDGs? Are they looking at, are they using the N N UN recommended indicators? Are they using their own indicators? Maybe they are not looking at all at indicators, which is the case of several cities. And how is the process? And what are the implications also with this process of adapting kind of indicators that are in a way political, agree globally, to a city level? And in a range of cities, as we have from you know, small city, Shimla, to maybe Gotham and Buenos Aires and little larger cities. Um, so why are we looking at that and what's the relevance? Uh, what could this, I mean, we, we started a little bit looking, okay, what could these agendas, both the new urban agenda and the agenda 2030 contribute to urban planning? Well, first they help assess, they could help assess local authorities where they stand. What are cities doing respect with sustainability, but also what are they not doing? What's missing? What are the gaps? Uh, and when they start looking at who's been included, you know, the both agendas talk a lot about participation, particip inclusiveness. Are they really in this process of uh, localizing the agendas? Are who's included in that conversation about the localization? Is it only the city government? Are there NGOs and private sector included? Something that we realize is in, in a lot of the cities, the first step has been a very internal city administration process. We need to understand what what does the city is already doing? And then I think some cities have started taking other steps of starting to engage with civil society and private sector. Then there's also the iso issue of data. What are the data gaps? Uh, and for several cities, like Kisumu and Shimla, that has been an important issue, realizing we don't have a structure. The cities don't have a structured way of monitoring data. Often it's project-based. And as soon as the project ends, the data gets lost. So how do harmonize so they un maintain data over time. Uh, make integrated assessments. There is the risk with the SDGs, with the Sustainable Development Goals, that even though the principles of Agenda 2030 is about these goals are indivisible, that is often we start looking at SDGs separately, and that we lose that overarching aspect of sustainability, looking at all aspects. So how do you balance between prioritizing and going into the De in depth versus breadth. Uh, and that's something that we've been looking at and we've been discussing and we hope to actually write some policy briefs about that uh, on Thursday when we have a little internal <laughs> workshop <laughs> on policy writing. And as David mentioned, one also thing that we have been hoping with the project and that we've been doing in different ways is to provide feedback to the UN in the process. And we've been submitting a few uh, good examples. Our project is a good example of a co-disciplinary, trans uh, transdisciplinary co-production and how these partnerships contribute to knowledge exchange and knowledge production. Uh, but of course, part of the process is also not just because there's this big agenda that everybody talks about, we should buy it as it is. We should also be critical of what does the agenda not include? What is missing? And then recognize that this is a political agenda in the end. This was agreed by politicians at the international level 
So what, what are the things that are not being said? What are the things that are kind of implicit or explicitly not being said, excluded and also included? And we should question also, especially for the local level, what are things that we are missing? So we've been starting to discuss informality is something that maybe is missing, not in that it's a big issue for many cities of the global south. Um, just shortly, we've, um, as any co-production process, we've got a lot of benefits and a lot of challenges. And of course, one challenge is for, and whether it's part of the project or not, was for local authorities, how to engage with these agendas given other priorities and day-to-day -day operations when there has been, you know, in the end of the year when cities have to report budgets, that's the priority, not maybe the SDGs. So there's some issues of prioritization. We've also seen the issue of silos, sectoral silos are still a big issue in most cities where what we really need is starting to work more cross-sectorally. I don't want to take too much time. Um, and we've had already some written outputs. We wrote last year, or now is it two years ago? No, last year at the beginning of the year, uh, city briefs. And this was very early on. And uh, most of the cities were just starting to work with these agendas, but they are available online where we give a very short summary of what has happened about this, what are the cities doing with respect to the SDGs. Uh, we've written an academic article, the whole research team, on some reflections on things to consider. Uh, there's also one article in Spanish from the Buenos Aires team reflecting on the co-production partnership and the process in Buenos Aires. We're hoping to have one uh, chapter about urban resilience with all of the case study cities. And we're in the process of working one academic article from each of the cities and one final report. Uh, the final reports will be ready in November, so you can check the website and we will have also a final project report ready in mid-November. Uh, and as I said, on Thursday we'll be working on producing some policy briefs based on the conclusions. And as I said, we've also submitted some contributions to the UN. Everything's available on the website, so if you go to the Mr. Urban Futures website and you check, look for the project, you actually find everything that we published and all of the things that we've submitted to the UN are available there. Shut this down. Um, starting from um, nearest me is Michael Oloko, who is the Deputy Director of our Kisumu platform and also uh, the lead researcher in Kisumu for this project. And then Mariana Kamisa, who is the SDG an analyst in the um, municipality of, of Buenos Aires. Um, who has been associated with the project, but her colleague who has been working mainly with Ileana Rosace um, from the university is uh, about to give birth. So uh, Mariana has kindly um, joined us in, in her place, but is also very familiar with the project. Then Sarah Peterson from the city executive office of Gothenburg municipality and who leads there on this work and has been working uh, in partnership with, with Sandra, who's based at, at Chalmers and doing the Gothenburg research, uh, as well as being the, the overall lead researcher for the project as a whole. And then Tarun Sharma from the Indian social enterprise Nagrika, uh, who is uh, leading on the work with Shimla municipality. And then Carol Wright uh, from the strategic um, planning policy department of the city of Cape Town and who's been partnering with um, Sylvia Crusa uh, based at the African Center for Cities who's the academic partner on the project and is over there and might want to contribute as I said about the UN summit um, a couple of weeks ago and then Joachim Nordqvist from Malmö who um, I don't know whether you can see it but he actually has a sort of line down the middle one half of him uh, is at the University of Malmö and the other is working in the city of Malmö on these issues as well. So he represents uh, the perfect synergy of the, the transdisciplinarity between the city and the university. So whether it's seamless or schizophrenic, we'll leave you to judge by the end of the session. As I said at the beginning, and there will be microphones going around, so if you would like to ask a question or contribute an observation from your own context, please just put up your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Uh, this is going to be 
uh, done as a sort of threaded discussion. So we're not going to start here and work around. I'm just going to pose some questions and issues. Um, then anybody on the panel who wants to respond to that one can do, and we'll pass the microphone around. So thinking about what we talked about in the opening session and what Sandra and I have already said by way of introduction to the work that we're doing here, um, how have you, in your respective local contexts, addressed the challenge of prioritization in relation to the SDGs, given that in every city, regardless of whether it's in an um, industrial or post-industrial society, the cases of, of, of Gothenburg would be particularly relevant, or seriously um, under-resourced, Kisumu and Shimla perhaps being the, the most obvious examples and the others somewhere in between. But how is the prioritization undertaken in those cities in terms of where to allocate those scarce resources, what to prioritize in relation to um, these global agendas and which SDGs, if you like, to focus on if not all 17 are equally feasible. So here's the microphone and um, just pass it down to whoever wants to talk. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David Simon. Uh, I would just want to say that um, from the perspective of Kisumu and uh, having worked on the project of SDG and at the same time a solid waste uh, comparative project, it has given me both local and uh, global perspective. In terms of uh, prioritization, I would want to say that in situations where there, are, there is limited resources, priority is based on a number of issues. And uh, both SDG, which is a global agenda, and the Solid Waste Comparative Project, which is more of local in this particular case, have gotten low priority in this particular case. I would want to say that uh, in the case of Solid Waste Comparative Project, it has given a different dimension, both north and south perspective. In a sense, solid waste is very unique in that if the system is working well, it is usually unnoticed. And that is what happens in the global north. And when it is not working well, I say it draws attention from various sectors, political, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At the same time, when it fails completely, then it is a crisis. So in looking at this particular project, we see a situation whereby we are working together with, uh, we are comparing Kisumu with a north uh, perspective that seems to be working well and everything seems to be perfect. But I want to say that the project now challenges even certain uh, practices that happens in the global north. And uh, yesterday was a very good example when we visited heat producing uh, a company in, in Sheffield where there were quite a lot of questions. What happens is that in some situation, priority is based on the local interest and not the global interest. And that we question some practices in the global north. In, uh, in such a way that it's assumed to be working well. I want to say that um, coming back to the SDG and in the case of uh, Kisumu, uh, a number of times we've had situations whereby we are told that there is no activity as SDG. But we know reference to solid waste management, it has effects on 12 SDG goals out of the 17. And it has very strong links with the targets within these 12 goals. That means, even though it is not visible among the SDG goals, it is a cross-cutting issue and we are all expected to respect, to take responsibility over this. 
And uh, make, going forward, one way of addressing this global agenda that many times come as a top-down approach. In Kisumu, there is no mechanism or framework at the ground level, at the local level, that would address this. So that is a limitation. And therefore, the national, from the national perspective, there is a responsibility to develop that kind of framework. In Kenya, there is inter-agency technical committee that is uh, established at the national level, and this is expected to work together with a number of agencies, including the donor development organization, so that they are able to cascade SDG to the local levels. Uh, we are lucky in Kenya there is also the devolved government system, which brings the Council of Governors that also works together with this interagency technical committee to try to localize the SDG activities or the X X SDGs at the county level. At the county itself, there is the SDG desk that is expected to be established to further localize this process to the sub-county levels. One effect or impact of the project is that it has brought all these three fronts into a discussion and we've had several workshops bringing the national SDG team together with the local SDG team when we realized in our first meeting that even though the approach in, is in three fronts, there is no linkage between or among these three fronts. So what, that is one impact that the project has created. Thank you so much. I will try to address uh, the limited point that you said that how to make SDGs relevant, especially in cities like Shimla and Kisumu, which have limited capacity, uh, both in terms of human resources and financial capacity. Uh, maybe three points, uh, broadly, the way we have worked through as an imagine uh, the, the administrators of this small corporation, as in if you, if you are in with them in their room, they're constantly on their phones because they're getting phone calls from, and it's a, it's a administrative capital of the big state. So people are always calling regarding their problems. So the way we've tried to do to make it relevant uh, through three broad ways. One is incremental. So what we have, uh, we've tried to win small battles. So SDG 11 first, uh, out of all the 17 SDGs, SDG 11 was uh, what we found and what the municipality was able to uh, relate with. Uh, so we decided to focus a lot more on the SDG 11. Within SDG 11, then again incrementally, we uh, boil down to some of the key areas over which the municipality has jurisdiction because we have almost 4,000 cities in India, but uh, the amount of delegation of functions that goes to the cities is very limited, especially to smaller cities. So uh, as you saw, the transport is, uh, is a key component of Sustainable Development Goal 11, but urban transport does not fall under the municipal corporation. The major responsibility of the municipality is on solid waste management and managing spaces within the city. So incrementally again within the SDG 11 uh, focused on these two aspects as well. Uh, then the second part is convergence, which is uh, to converge with what the city is already doing because again that helps them to uh, relate it a lot more uh, easily with the effort that they are making. So SDGs allows them to say that this is where they stand and this is where they, they can progress. But if they converge it with some of the existing programs, for example, uh, every year there is a ranking uh, called uh, Clean India Ranking, and which has a clear component on uh, uh, the sanitation and cleanliness in the city. And nationally, that is a lot more relevant to them. But the indicators that they are supposed to report are very similar to what the SDGs uh, uh, also ask them to report. 
And similarly, other programs ask them to report on uh, the amount of public spaces that they are uh, available. So again, converge the uh, SDG elements with what the existing programs already ask them to work on. And the third part is on using SDGs and such global frameworks to uh, make their day-to-day -day functioning uh, look like it's strategic. Because otherwise, the way they function is that this is something that they take for granted, that they have to carry out these functions. But once you give them a lens of, say, sustainable development goals, uh, it becomes more strategic. Because you have a timeline, you have a horizon, you have multiple actors who are looking at this framework. Uh, so again, it helps to make it more relevant. So I think these three uh, have been, in a way, the key elements for us to engage with Shimla. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. I think from the city of Cape Town, we've had a slightly different approach um, in that we've anchored our SDG work and our new urban agenda work in the, in the city's resilience strategy. And I did a quick refresh last night <laughs> <laughs> on that. It was approved in, in uh, July. Um, and we very purposefully and worked in quite a lot of depth with the resilience team in the building up of, of the resilience strategy because we felt that we wanted an anchor strategy for the city um, and it had some very good um, ticks for us and positives in terms of its long term, it included a number of stakeholders um, and uh, we, we wanted something to, uh, something that we didn't want to just uh, go out and start um, championing the SDGs on their own. So in terms of, of um, the question which David has posed us in terms of the basic needs, um, the resilience strategy has four dimensions and um, the, the anchor one is health and well-being and addressing basic needs. So I think we will be working with the team um, in, in a number of, the, of those areas um, are, are going forward. And there, uh, there are a range of drivers and 50 sub-drivers and about 150 projects. So we will be using that um, as, a, as our main vehicle. Um, in parallel, we, we are working with a broad research team, our researchers across the city, so it's not only ourselves and our policy makers, and where they show interest, um, we then work with them on a, on a sort of project by project basis. So we have um, identified um, solid waste management strategy that needs to be refreshed, it needs to be broadened in the city, it's very operational at the moment, so we're going to look at a more whole of city of approach. And so we're working with the practitioners and the policy makers and the researchers in that community. So we're using our Mistress Urban Futures uh, method of, of working within that discussion and taking that forward. Looking at uh, the city of Malmo, it, it's quite interesting also to see how um, social uh, sustainability has been a, a very important driver for many years and that of course fits very neatly into the, uh, the structure of the goals. Um, the goal that has been um, highlighted the most though, perhaps so far, is goal 14 <coughs> from the city, uh, life below water, which is where the city of Malmö has particularly put in efforts um, within the framework of the SDGs. Then there is a lot of work that's going on that fits with the uh, structure as a whole, but doesn't use it uh, in that sense. Um, but we can see that the use of the, uh, um, the framework is picking up also in uh, other sectors. So uh, a lot of uh, collaborations between different parties based in Malmö use the, the, uh, the SDGs and Agenda 2030 in their um, justification for, for partnerships and so on. Also partnerships where the municipality takes part. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me, David. Um, so in Buenos Aires City, we have uh, prioritized 16 out of the 17 SDGs. Um, the one that we don't work on is number 14, life below water, because the city doesn't have competencies over the sea. 
Um, but in this prioritization, there are some SDGs that stand out of the vision, the city we want to build, right? So we uh, work a lot on SDG 4, specifically in digital education. SDG 5, we have a gender comprehensive agenda that takes the three dimensions of women autonomy, defined by the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. That's physical autonomy, autonomy sorry, economic autonomy, and autonomy in decision making. We also are working on um, developing the job market and the jobs of the future. So we start, you know, working now on the jobs that people will have tomorrow. We also work a lot in um, climate change. We we are starting to build our climate change agenda and trying to reach um, the carbon neutral commitment for 2050. Um, we believe that all this is only possible if we have strong institutions, citizen participation, and an active transparency policy. So this relates a lot with SDG 16. Um, regarding the topics that we are discussing in, in this panel, I would like to focus on transport because many years ago cities were built for cars, not for people. But right now we're realizing that we want cities on human scales, but we don't have the infrastructure for that. So in Buenos Aires, we have a sustainable mobility plan that is based on our traditional, if you want, transport system like buses and underground and train. But we are also focusing a lot on healthy mobility. So we developed pedestrian areas in the center of the city so people walk more. And we also have a, a bike system that is free. You just need an app on your phone and you go to one of the 300 bike stations and you can take the bike and use the cycle lanes that we have almost 235 kilometers of. And this system has 300,000 registered users. So this not only you know, contributes to reducing emissions and you that you can move in the city safely and environmentally friendly, but also to your health because you increase your active well-being. So although we have these separated SDGs, um, we believe that they are all connected in some way, right? Yeah. Yeah, so in the city of Gothenburg, we don't have any political prioritization to connected to the SDGs. We have a strong prioritization to sustainable uh, development in all three dimensions and to become a sustainable city, but they haven't given us any guidelines regarding the SDGs. But we have done, on a, a management level, a mapping uh, of both our steering documents to... Uh, to figure out how the how they in line with the with the SDGs and also with the political budget, which is a yearly document, um, and um, we can see that they do uh, prioritize all the goals, uh, which could also be be a problem, but in in different ways. And um, and, and but two um, areas which are are um, prioritized through very um, strategic and, and meaning um, uh, documents for us and, and very high set goals are the um, work on equity and climate. And then climate and equity in a quite broad sense. Um, um, and you can also see that there's uh, a lot of prioritization in investments in that goes into both housing and um, also into infrastructure. Uh, it's very visible if you come and visit the city of Gothenburg right now because it's a big, it's a large building site. Uh, you cannot move around. But uh, in the future, it will be very <laughs> easy to move around in a sustainable way, hopefully. Yeah, and, and I also, sorry, I, I need to add that as far as prioritization and looking into synergies and, and, and conflicts, Sandra's research is, is helping us right now to sort this out and make it more clearly to us and hopefully also to our politicians how our steering documents and how our goals 
uh, help each other uh, by um, through synergies in in uh, in these different programs. We have a lot of programs, like 66 strategic programs to to um, steer and 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 our daily day-to-day -day operations on on a long term, and um, and also very importantly find what synergies are we missing and uh, and what conflicts do we have thanks um any questions or thoughts reflections um from your perspectives okay there's a mic coming around so we've got two here on the left yeah yeah, yeah it's alive Thanks. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Marianne from um, a program called Livable Cities at the University of Birmingham. No. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Take this one. Hi, I'm, I'm Marianne from the University of Birmingham. I've been part of the Livable Cities program. Um, I wanted to ask. Um, Having worked in um, complex um, contexts in the Middle and Far East, how do you maintain focus um, in local challenges when, there, um, when you have this complexity in um, the urban environment? For example, if um, there are certain data sets missing in the city, how do you avoid copying something that another city has done? Thank you. Uh, my name is Lorraine from the University of East Anglia. Probably just a reflection or a comment or a question. In terms of uh, SDGs as a framework, so they travel into these city spaces. So at the urban level, at the city uh, level, you find that you know different city governments prioritize certain SDGs, or they even look at all of them. How do we deal with the, you know, the competition between or among these SDGs? You may find in one city, climate change may be dominating, so in terms of resources, maybe resources are channeled to climate change. But then if you just go at one level lower set from the city level, let's say ward by ward or district by district, you may find that one community housing is the issue. You know, water may be the issue. So from your own experience, how do we move from whereby a city is priori prioritizing SDGs, but how do they then decide that this community gets um, more support, this doesn't? Because some people don't even have platforms where their voices are heard, where they, they can express that these are our issues. How are they beginning to navigate some of those issues? Thank you. Hi, my name is Jez Hall from Manchester, Shared Future. I'm just interested in one of the vision statements for the Sustainable Development Goals. It says, we envisage a world in which every country enjoys sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth and decent work for all. And there's a real challenge in that, both in what is, can we actually keep growing, and then how do we make it equity between countries which have enjoyed the benefits of growth over a long period of time and others which are still seeking to grow. So I just wonder that challenge around economic growth within the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. Right, who'd like to respond? No compulsion to answer all or indeed any. So regarding your question of how we m try to work with the SDGs, um, as I said before, I think we need to think about the SDGs not as separated topics but how they all include many inside. For instance, when we talk about climate change, we don't only talk about SDG 13, right? We talk about energy, that is SDG 7. We talk about uh, responsible consumption and production, that is SDG 12. We talk about transport, SDG 11, and so many more. 
Um, and also what I forgot to say is that we also work a lot on SDG 11. So in Buenos Aires, um, we're going through social and urban integration processes. And this is mainly focused on slums and building new housing. And if you look at that, yes, um, access to housing touches SDG 11, but it also touches SDG 1 because you have public services access there uh, to basic services. And what we try to do is um, approach our policies from a holistic and comprehensive point of view. So we, we hire um, local um, workers from the areas so there you have SDG 8, and we try to bring closer public services such as education or health. So there you have SDG 4 and SDG 3. So I think in order for public policies to be effective and sustainable and to meet the three dimensions of sustainable development, you have to think about all you know, these, these topics that basically would, would make life better for our citizens. I don't know if that maybe answers your question. Uh, <coughs> in addition to, uh, to your reflection and uh, in response also to the second question, um, I think it's uh, useful to also realize and think about that these conflicts of interests don't occur because of uh, of Agenda 2030 and the SDGs, they've always been there. So what the agenda can do is that it creates a, um, a common lens uh, and a common language that we can actually use for, um, for the purpose of dealing with them. And this is a, a huge challenge in, in cities because I think we tend to forget when we look at cities from the outside that they are not um, single actors. They are quite uh, heterogeneous with lots of different interests and conflicts of interests um, and um, fights for influence within themselves. So this is actually something where the agenda might be useful for the cities themselves, but also for for onlookers, mm -hmm. to to have a framework to to deal with these conflicts. Um, and I think just to add to the second question, because we seem to be uh, there for the moment, but we will get to the others. Um, I think that's <laughs> where um, the focus on localization is so important, and I think, uh, and that might be. We, where we need to focus more on the local because um, yes, it has uh, these frameworks are there from global, but to make a difference and to to have real impact, uh, they have to be localized. So, I think um, uh, it would be useful to um, use the framework to then have discussions um, with your with uh, the administration possibly as a start then uh, uh, on, on the policy side, the policy priorities, look at evidence, um, and then at the different levels, citywide, local. Um, we are also mindful in Cape Town about the local level. We don't want to go down to ward because that is quite a political space and our wards change as well when we have every five years. So we are looking at a more neighborhood level. So we, we with the resilience, strategy we're going to go down to a neighborhood level um, um, so th I think I think the challenge is to to create that space of your local um, SDG um, implementation um, I'll answer maybe question two one three and somewhat together um, I think regarding your question on can we continue you know there is SDG eight and nine on you know continue with sustainable growth, infra sustainable infrastructure, but can we continue really the current paradigm, economic paradigm, and really in a limited planet? And, and I think that is something that the agenda does not address. And I think that is one of the big issues. The agenda 2030 with its SDGs starts from the basis of the current system. And it talks a lot about transformation, about reaching you know, yeah, sustainable development, but it's 
based on the current economic system. It doesn't question the economic system, and it's not meant to question it. Uh, again, it's a political agenda. So I think it would have been very difficult at the global level to, to come up, to agree on an agenda where suddenly the current economic system had to be put into question. But it should. I mean, it, it maybe that's part, and that's when we said that, when I said earlier about being critical. I think those questions are very important. And I think it comes together with the issue of conflicts and, and trade-offs. And we say, and we see that as we start looking at particular SDGs, so you see there are SDGs on 11, or targets under SDG 11, on increasing housing. Okay, yes, we, it is important to provide housing, good access to housing, affordable housing to people. But what are the implications for competition with land? What are the implications when you have increasing housing and then maybe that leads to increasing consumption? So then you have a negative implication potentially on SDG 12. And I think in a way, as, as Joachim said, the agenda maybe brings a common language and a common reflection to think about this, but I think it's also a reminder, hopefully not to lose the other issues. The idea of that we should look at the SDGs together should help cities and should help whatever level we're looking at to remind, okay, if I work on this issue, what are the both the positive and the negative implications on other? Yes, with the, with the constraint that it is under the assumption that we continue with you know, a capitalist system of econ you know, that is based on growth, and then maybe that also requires reflection on ca what kind of economic system do we need to really make sure that we can live within the planetary boundaries and, and that we can really share resources among all the population. Maybe just also complementing something that Carol mentioned on the importance of localizing. But it, it is very important to localize because that's where a lot of action will happen. At the same time, we have to be careful to think, okay, we do one action and limit our actions to, let's say, the boundaries of Cape Town. What's happening, what's the influence of those actions maybe outside the Cape Town boundary uh, or uh, even outside at the, na at the national level and global? So I think there is also the importance of making sure that we're always thinking about the link of the implications of actions locally to other areas, uh, both positive and negative, when it comes to job creation, to competition over land, uh, it could be production of food. Uh, I, think, I think all of these links are very important to maintain. And hopefully, the agenda can help us as a reminder of that. But I think it's easy to, to be, again, to forget that and sometimes be too focused on the SDGs. And it's, it's an important reminder that, that the purpose is to keep all of those aspects together. Just to add something on uh, uh, to add something on the uh, uh, what happens at a different level with reference to Kenya, I would want to say that um, at every local level, uh, prioritization is based on the local need. Uh, so you find that priorities in one particular region might not be the same priority in another diff in another region, and uh, one thing that comes out is that um, most of the local regions or the counties in Kenya, they have mainstreamed their, they have main mainstreamed SDGs within their working program. So that means activities that relate to SDGs come out uh, clearly in their annual activities. So in that way, uh, they are able to get access to budget lines and also ev ev evaluated just like any other um, activities. And uh, I also want to say that uh, in this, the whole setup, it doesn't matter, hope this is related to question number three, that uh, we are working as from different cities that are at different levels as far as SDG, uh, SDGs are concerned. But one important thing is that we have learned from the strengths and weaknesses from various cities. Kisumu has learned from uh, maybe Shimla of having a strong monitoring and evaluation system, but also good practice of Kisumu that is mainstreaming the S SDG uh, activities within the 
uh, integrated development plans and the annual plans. This is also an experience that is shared uh, with other cities. Thank you. Just short. I think that it's it's important that we also um, dare to prioritize because I think you need to do that on a local level because that's how uh, it becomes more clear and where you should focus. But at the same time, I think the agenda then can help us not to lose any other um, goals uh, or, or dimensions of sustainability that needs to be addressed. Because if it would be only up to like a local level to prioritize, I think a lot of the other questions could be forgotten. And with this agenda, we can, we can still keep all those uh, goals alive at the same time, because uh, a lot of these um, operations are, are part of a, of a municipal um, all of the, a lot of the goals are part of a, a municipal's day-to-day -day operation, like, like education and, and, and um, so, so even though climate or equality, equality might be like on the political agenda, still the other, the other goals will, will be prioritized, uh, will be happening <laughs> anyway, so yeah. I wanted to respond to the first question on data. I'm sorry, I hope I get the <laughs> your question correct. I think we sometimes can be quite consumed by data and it's very important and, and the city of Cape Town has put a lot of effort into a data strategy, research strategy. Um, but we, if I'm honest about it, we are in quite a data scarce um, environment. Um, we only have a national census every 10 years where we really get the level of, d of data that we need and sometimes um, even then not on the variables we would like, etc. cetera. Um, so I think we've learned to, which is quite counterintuitive, I think when you come out of an academic space, uh, you, you make do with what you've got. Um, and where there are big gaps, uh, you, what I would call professionally crowdsource. So you actually bring in people who um, are, have worked in the area, who might be, have expertise in the area, and you put them around a table and you, you draw together the information that you need or, and you pull it together and you, you then maybe do a second round of peer review um, to just pull together what you may need um, in, in that um, and, and slowly start that um, data gathering process. Uh, and I think it's also to review what you need data for. You know, is it for um, understanding where you are? Is it around the targets? Um, is it around planning? So the multi or monitoring, that's often forgotten about. Um, and if you can try and map that, and if projects and programs are being put into place, try and tag on um, two or three data collection points where you can slowly start building up. But I'm happy to chat to you afterwards. Let's see if this is working. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that's a really important point because all too often, apparent lack of data becomes an academic or indeed a, uh, an official reason for inaction. Mm. Let's delay it. Yeah. Let's get better data yeah. so we yeah. don't get it wrong. Yeah. But I think part of the point about these sustainability agendas and the transitions and transformations that they are intended to is we don't have time no. to delay. Mm. So there are all these innovative technologies, data apps and so on, where you can use <coughs> citizen science to engage local communities in a shanty town, a favela, uh, a deprived neighborhood, uh, a downtown area or whatever, in, in very innovative ways. And there's more and more literature on this. But I think the key message in a sense that I would echo from what Carol said is we should not Thank you. 
Maybe I can very briefly talk about how Shimla Corporation, and I must stress on the word corporation. Uh, in India, uh, municipal bodies statutorily are supposed to be third tier of government as per the constitution. But the essential function and in all the legal documents, in uh, all the statutory documents, the word that you find is corporation uh, because they exist as business entities with a social function. Uh, so the main objective these corporations have is to raise revenue and raise money. Uh, with that function in mind, they of course are implementing a lot of programs that the state government and the national governments impose uh, at the national level. And that's the same with Shimla Municipal Corporation, that uh, if you look at the balance sheet and budgets, uh, almost 60 to 70 percent of their budget comes from grants from the state government and the national government. Uh, so their agendas including uh, implementing say sustainable development goals uh, is also subservient to the uh, agendas that are put forward by the state and the national governments. Uh, having said that, Municipal Corporation of Shimla has been still a front runner in being able to create organic partnerships with a lot of uh, uh, national and international civil society organization and research institutes. They have done a, a city resilience index and a city resilience strategy earlier. They're not part of the 100 resilient cities, but they have done this before. And uh, being an administrative capital, um, there is a direct line of contact with the state administration and through that to the national administration as well. And what also matters a lot is the, I think which is true for multiple other cities as well, the political dispensation that exists at all these three different levels. So if uh, you're trying to drive through an agenda and if there is a common uh, 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 regime at all these three different levels, it's easier to get through, which is the case in Shimla right now. At the national, state, and at the city level, the, the politicians uh, represent the same uh, party. Yeah. So the, the Swedish national level is, um, is a bit ambition to be a front runner in, in working with the SDGs, uh, and which is quite easy because we are uh, doing quite well on a lot of these these areas uh, and and the local level is um, pointed out as uh, important to uh, realizing the the goals um, but and it's encouraged but uh, not enforced and uh, in Sweden the local level has a very large um, mandate and and we have our own taxes so we we get to decide what we do <laughs> and so so therefore uh, the national level only s sort of encourage but doesn't infor enforce and and in in the city of gothenburg we don't have any uh, strong political um, direction uh, for the S sdgs definitely for sustainable development but not for the sdgs but uh, good and bad is that we have a yearly budget. It always feels too short, but on the other hand, there's always a new chance. <laughs> and uh, and uh, by the end of this week, uh, we will get a, a hint of our new budget. So if this would have been a conference in, in one week, maybe I should have, will say something different, that we have a very strong political will, <laughs> will in this this area. But uh, but um, now we're we're still hoping, yeah. And <coughs> as a contrast um, or complement to Gothenburg, because Malmö is uh, also in Sweden, it's interesting to compare the two, where Malmö is seen nationally and also perceives itself as being a front runner among municipalities uh, with regards to the uh, SDGs and uh, claiming that it's the first municipality to have adopted the, uh, the agenda and the SDGs and to incorporate it into its, uh, its uh, um, how it works. So I think 
due to this narrative and due to connections between uh, local leaders in the municipality of Malmo and the, on the national level, there is a lot of um, uh, exchange between the levels and Malmo is brought in to advise on the national level on these issues more so than other municipalities, which is interesting then. Um, from the South African perspective and then down to Cape Town, um, we are still finding each other, I think. <laughs> um, nationally, um, the SDG's responsibility seems to be split amongst another number of departments. Um, so we still need to get national direction and guidelines. Um, and that's one of the areas that um, Sylvia has been really helpful and working very hard <coughs> from our perspective, but she's been able to, to keep those connections and to, to, to make those connections um, too for us. Um, and so I think, if I'm honest, uh, the three spheres of government um, are working I more independently at the moment. But we are positive that our work um, in Cape Town, we linking out to other metro metropolitan cities. So we have what we call Category A municipalities, which have um, uh, more extended powers and functions. And we're hoping to, f uh, to informally have a network of, of cities that we can then collaborate and then engage with national government and see how we can um, have a, a strong collaboration going forward. But we very much in the early phases of that. Of course, where this sometimes gets a little messy is where, as in South Africa, different elements of, let's just say, housing fall within the remit of local, provincial, and national governments. And, and those dots haven't yet been neatly joined up if, if at all. So there is a whole lot of work in progress, which I think is what you were saying in a more euphemistic way. <laughs> Yeah, um, in our case, we have the national government has a council that works on the SDGs and their work is really good with the different provinces and municipalities and the, you know, the different levels of governance. But I think in our case, our challenge is what Sandra and Carol were talking about um, just a minute ago, that it's the metropolitan area. So Buenos Aires has three million inhabitants but during the day, we have six million people in the city that come from the metropolitan area that has 14 million inhabitants. And uh, it's what you were talking about, that our cities have these kind of, you know, borders that services stop or um, there's not really a coordination or cooperation between public policies. And Buenos Aires case, it's very particular because um, Argentina is a federal country and we have 23 provinces that are autonomous. But Buenos Aires is a city, but it's also autonomous. So it's like a hybrid between the province and the city and we have the resources of the province, but we, we have three million inhabitants that together with the metropolitan area, it's over a quarter of Argentina's population. So up to this date, um, there hasn't been any real, you know, advances in how we are working together with the metropolitan area and to be honest in the short term uh, I don't think that there will be either so this is a really big challenge that we're facing I think. In the case of uh, Kenya uh, the multi-level coordination and cooperation is something that needs to be enhanced uh, the Kenyan government system is a devolved system. That means we have the national government and the county governments in, the, in, 14, in, in 47 counties. Uh, what happens is that there are some functions uh, that are devolved and some functions are not devolved. So uh, certain uh, services are handled di directly from the national level with the ministries at the national level. And some functions that are devolved are expected to be handled wholly at the county levels. When we look at the SDGs, they cut across. And uh, this is why the coordinating institutions 
uh, that is the Interagency Technical Committee that is uh, anchored at the national level and uh, uh, forms part of the National SDG Secretariat is supposed to bring together uh, the national line ministries and also coordinate with the county governments. And uh, this has not been easy because the framework uh, is not been in place so that the two systems can coordinate the devolved functions and the de non-devolved function. And that is why the Council of Governors, which has an overall uh, role and uh, function to decentralize, to localize SDGs at the county level, has the mandate now to coordinate functions, both devolved and non-devolved function, and bring together all information that can uh, be used uh, to report on the SDGs. So uh, it is a little complicated, but it is something that uh, is being dealt with at the national level, and the Council of Governors of late is coming up strongly so that they can effectively bridge this gap. Mark, let me uh, invite you in if you can grab the mic. Thank you, David. Uh, it's Mark Whitworth, and I'm the Service Manager for Sustainability and Climate Change at Sheffield City Council. Um, so I'm, I'm probably not best placed to be responding on the whole UK picture, but in terms of um, my understanding of where things are, um, the UK government have been fairly fundamental in terms of leading some of this um, work, and obviously for the past few years um, have been driving forward SDGs within uh, within government, but I think there is a question around actually then how that's then implemented um, and then been put out towards local authorities, for example, and how uh, local councils such as Sheffield then go about implementing those. Uh, earlier this year, there was a, a national voluntary review uh, of the SDGs, and um, within the government, the uh, the Office for National Statistics, the ONS, are responsible for for reporting on on progress and the commitments that the, the government has made as part of the UN to actually deliver those uh, progress on, on those goals. So as things stand at the moment, there is no um, requirement as such for local authorities to, to actually use the SDGs. Um, and so what we have is a bit of a mixed picture around the country, and, and I think, you know, reflecting on some of the, the, the views of the panel, it's very similar, I think, in across, across the country. In terms of we've got uh, cities such as Bristol, um, Liverpool and, and obviously work in Manchester where uh, the SDGs have been applied in, in various um, different forums. So, for example, in Liverpool, there's a, an independent uh, organisation that's working with businesses to actually apply the SDGs and to actually work with, uh, with local enterprises. Um, Bristol have built this into the, some of their work they're doing with their Green City Partnership, so there's some really, really good work that's, that's going on there. Um, and so it is a very mixed picture where in some other places there's, there's very little sort of uptake or use of, of, of the SDGs directly. I think fast forward to where we are with, with, with Sheffield, um, we, we are in a sense, um, I guess, sort of a bit new kid on the block in terms of this, this particular programme. We came on to the, um, the work around the, the Realising Just Cities programme last year and uh, researchers from, from the University of Sheffield have been helping do some work around looking at uh, how our overarching strategies, so they reviewed 30 or so of our, of our strategies to look at how those contribute towards the UN SDGs and identified that out of about 89 uh, targets, there's about 61 or so that are actually close ali closely aligned. Um, and then they also undertook further work around looking at how, for example, some of our work that was emerging on the transport strategy contributed to the SDGs and where there were linkages. Uh, and again, I think it was really a uh, useful process in terms of identifying where some of those wider connections were. Also, I think sort of identifying where some of the conflicts were around the, the, the three areas of, of, of the strategy, particularly around uh, the economy, around environment and around equity. So, you know, again, a very, a very useful tool. But again, I think, you know, just demonstrating that sort of that, that variety across the country in terms of progress and where different local authorities and other organisations um, other businesses, because of course, 
you know, this is something that businesses have picked up and are, are running with, are in terms of that sort of spectrum and working on that. Lovely. Thanks very much. And I think that last point is, is crucial um, about the variety within countries. I and mean, we're fortunate um, within the project in being able to compare Gothenburg and Malmö, as, as you've heard. But for the rest, it's one city per country. And I think that point about how very different the attitudes, the capabilities, the level of engagement and proactivity um, towards these global agendas varies in country as well. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. I mentioned earlier, and, and Mark picked it up as well, this idea of voluntary national contributions. This is one of the components of the Paris Accord on, on climate change, which moved from what was going to be an enforceable agenda to voluntary contributions to the global uh, emissions reduction program. Now, part of the significance of what we've been talking about, Agenda 2030, the new urban agenda, Sendai, and, and, and so on, is that that set of agreements in 2015-16, pretty well for the first time in, in UN history, recognized what the UN language calls subnational entities, which in plain English refers to all levels of governance below the national level, regional, provincial, state, county, whatever they might be, and local, um, for the first time. And that is because we now live in a predominantly urban and in many places still urbanizing world. And therefore, if these targets are to be met, given that most of the emissions are emitted in urban areas, Urban areas are where we have the highest densities and highest capabilities of people and where the opportunities exist to make a rapid and positive difference to the sustainability challenge. Um, it would not be possible for national governments to do this alone and that's why we've been emphasizing the idea of multi-level partnerships as essential if we're to make meaningful progress towards, as I said in the introduction, the idea of sustainable cities only being feasible if they're part of sustainable societies. And in that context, it was interesting, uh, about a year or 18 months ago, after um, President Trump announced the intention to pull the USA out of the Paris Accord, that New York led the way in saying, we're going to do this ourselves locally, and they created and submitted last year to the UN High-Level Political Framework Assessment of Goal 11, their own um, attempt to do this. And that movement has caught on. Helsinki in Finland followed, there have been several others. And as I said in my introduction to the session, at the UN summit on climate change a couple of weeks ago in New York, the idea of creating an urban level of this, now called voluntary local contributions, received official um, status. And Sylvia was there, so uh, in, in terms of trying to draw this discussion to a close, let me ask her just to provide some brief reflections and, and explanations of what that is now intended to, to embrace. Thank you, David. I, I wouldn't say that it received, what did you say, of official status, because the thing is in the, um, should I stand up or? <laughs> in the... So when the SDGs were adopted, the official framework for reviewing and monitoring includes those voluntary national reviews that are submitted uh, to the UN by national governments. But there was never a real framework that included how local governments could report on their progress. So this has kind of grown in an organic way, uh, sometimes in cases where national government wasn't kind of um, stepping up. So cities said, okay, we're taking our own initiative to report on what we are planning to do to achieve the SDGs. And this has now started to grow. So, so far about 15 cities have presented their, or have prepared VLRs to cities across the world. Um, and during the SDG summit a few weeks back in New York, uh, a number of other cities joined this movement. And so my impression is that, so New York has been reaching out to cities across the world and kind of asking them to come on board. So um, uh, there's three cities from our group that are actually sitting here that have also signed up uh, to be part of this group. So Buenos Aires, who had, that had already presented its VR this year, and the city of Malmo and Cape Town as well. 
Um, so even though this is actually an unofficial way in which cities are trying to kind of position themselves and come up with their own review uh, mechanisms and presenting and sharing this uh, with the UN, it's not an official mechanism yet. And so unlike with the VNRs where there are actual guidelines that have been set up by the UN to outline how cities should be reporting, there's not a, a uniform set of guidelines. So this is very much still kind of in progress, but it's very exciting to see how cities are, are really kind of stepping up and, and coming up with their own uh, ways of reporting. Um, and it will be interesting to see going forward whether this will actually be included into the official review mechanisms. And I've, I, did, I have heard kind of anecdotally that there may be, uh, and this was, it was possibly already the case this time, but I'm not sure that it happened, that there would be a proposal to the UN General Assembly to actually include the VLRs in the official review mechanism. So maybe going forward that may still happen. If cities really make a lot of noise, <laughs> at some point maybe the UN can't get around them and say, okay, we actually need to include this. Um, and I think that would be really interesting because so far, national governments have not always actually consulted their local governments when they would prepare their VNRs. So I think it will be a very important tool to make the voices of cities heard. We're almost out of time, but um, if anybody has any quick reflections or questions, we'll squeeze a couple in. And please just identify yourself. Oh, um, hello, I thought I'd just make a few comments. Um, my name's Michelle Cook, I'm an elected councillor in Sheffield City Council. Um, and I thought I'd just make a few comments. Um, this is absolutely fantastic. It's brilliant to um, hear from people all over the world. Um, what we've been doing in, in Sheffield politically, um, we declared a climate emergency last year it, um, um, alongside other cities you know, in the UK. And what this means is we've been looking at the S DGs. In, as people have said, it's very much in an official way at the moment, uh, but we're seriously looking at what we can do as quickly as possible to implement um, actions that will mitigate climate change in terms of our um, waste, waste reduction and um, particularly transport and um, encouraging cycling and things like that. So we've got, we've got quite, a, quite a long list of things that we're trying to do quite rapidly. Um, and so we're really, really welcome, we're really, really proud that you've come um, to our city to launch this year's conference. And um, it's something that I've been working on with the university for the last four or five years, so I'm really, really pleased personally. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to the rest of the conference and obviously sharing some ideas and um, getting things going. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. And maybe that's an extremely appropriate point in, in which to break. But I think the point about climate emergency and the need to move beyond a simple declaration into action is, is really, really important. And actually, it's no coincidence that just yesterday, the UK National Committee on Climate Change issued um, a report. One of the key components of that was trying to think about joined up action. And the one example, you may have even seen this in the national press yesterday, was the way in which, um, as they identify, the, the schemes that many airlines use and many of us um, are enrolled in of, of frequent flyer points as a way to incentivize more air travel is actually perverse in the context of a climate emergency. So they were arguing that it should be reversed. So rather than being incentives, it should be a penalty system for frequent flyers. Now let's see whether that gains teeth and how those of us in this room who are embedded in those networks are affected. Um, but it's I illustrative of some of this, the difficult choices that will have to be made. And ultimately, each of us as individuals and members of, of households of, of whatever shape and size will have to address because none of this is going to make sense if we simply rely passively on governments, whoever and wherever they might be at every scale, to do it. We're all going to have to become part of the solution as well as embedded as parts of the problem. So with that, let's go and secure our short-term food security next door. And thank you all very much for uh, making this a fascinating session. And of course, particular thanks to our panel and other members of the team, Sylvia and Ileana.
um, who are not on the platform.